Well, do excuse me, I'm not in my suit, I'm in my training gear, I've come in from training. Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist, and I just want to do a quick one on shun. Um, this terrible shunning thing, you know, it originates out of um, trying to put God or Jehovah or your religion first. And it births out of a fear of thinking that the other person's going to sabotage your position with your saviour, whoever might that be. In the case of the Jehovah Witnesses, Jehovah. They have Jesus as a mediator, but um, as I understand uh, from the worldly spouse today, um, just give me some insights on the fact that only 144,000, um, and Robert from the Comedy Channel actually brought this up, Christian Comedy Channel, only 144,000 are protected by the mediator. Um, and this causes a lot of undermining into the bonding of people in these organisations because if somebody starts to waver, then there's got to be a priority made. Is it going to be made towards the people that I love or is it going to be made towards the religion that I have my hope in? And this causes some really horrible situations. It's not exclusive to the Jehovah Witnesses. This goes throughout most religions. The very devoted, the ones that are pushing hard to try and make their God or their religion or their organization come first, they're doing it to the expense of the people that are closest to them. Now, some people can hang on for years under this kind of what I call tyrannical abuse under the guise of religion. Um, others don't last quite as long. Um, you'll find that these people are the ones that jump the fence and have affairs because they'll come across somebody that seems to be as um, committed and devoted as what they are and the partner that they have at that time isn't. So there's got to be a choice made for me to further myself or to make myself look right between my God and, and within my religion. I've got to find somebody that's up to the standard that I'm at. And this is where shunning and all this other tyrannical abuse, psychological abuses and all this other stuff births itself. Now, what I wanted to show you, and this is what a lot of people don't realise, 99.9% .9 of Christianity don't realise, and particularly Jehovah Witnessism, they say, why do you use the Jehovah Witness Bible? Well, I'm, I'm you know, I, I've got to be fair to the Jehovah Witnesses. I'm speaking to them and about their religion and I'm not afraid of their Bible um, as, as, and I don't want to be too critical of it to undermine the listeners but it has to be a way for me to try and be fair to them in reaching them now Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 the serpent we know who the serpent is now this idea that the serpent was kicked out in 1914 is a load of hogwash the position of the serpent hasn't changed from this point here in Genesis to where we are today in modern time. I'm going to say that again. The position and the, um, the region in which the devil can wander hasn't changed from this point in history till now. His authority changed when Jesus died on the cross. But he can still roam around wherever he wants. He's not exclusively limited to earth. He's had access to heaven and earth since he was created. Of course, he was um, de-authoritized. He lost his primary position when he chose to cause trouble and rebel. But he still has access to heaven and earth, um, no different to what it was here now. Now, the serpent was more cautious. Now, cautious is a word used here, but on the evil side. Cautious in the sense of that he wanted to produce evil, but was very cunning in how it was going to come about. And all the wild animals of the field that Jehovah God had made. So it was said to the woman, did God really say, and so on and so forth. And we come down, <clears throat> we know this story, and there's a lot in it, for instance, like, um, Jehovah God, we, we see the word Jehovah and God. As soon as the devil opens his mouth, he leaves out the word Jehovah. Did God, he's left out Jehovah, which would be very 
crucial to the Jehovah Witnesses. I'm not sure if any Jehovah Witnesses have noticed this before. But if we go back to chapter 2, this is things that, you know, you should see but you don't. Um, it says that on the seventh day God completed the work that he'd been doing and so on and so forth. And this is the history of how the heavens in the time they were created in the day that Jehovah God, and so now we're introduced to this Jehovah God made the heavens and the earth. And Jehovah God, right? And Jehovah God went on to form the man out of the dust. There's a whole, haven't got time to go into that. But we see it's Jehovah God, okay? And then it's Jehovah God, please bear with me. And then it's Jehovah God, right? And then where's the next one? Where is he? He wouldn't be too far away. And it's Jehovah God, okay? After man was made, it was Jehovah God. And Jehovah God, okay, said. And Jehovah God, sorry if I've missed one, said, let us make man and so on and so forth. And, and thus it was, that is why a man will leave his father and his mother and he will stick to his wife and they will become one flesh. And both of them continue to be naked, the man and his wife. Yet they were not ashamed. Now, as soon as, and this is very important, and I'm sure the Jehovah Witnesses can relate to this, given the sanctity that they put on the name Jehovah. So the serpent was the most cautious, cautious in his cunning to bring about evil. Um, and this is still common today. Of all the wild animals of the field that Jehovah God had made. Now, many of you listening right now may not have noticed what I'm about to show you, but as soon as the serpent opens his mouth, he leaves out Jehovah. He just says, has God, like, just say your name's John Smith, and excuse me if it is. Oh, did Smith say, you know, an undermining statement, a cautious cunning undermining statement did god really say that you must not eat from every tree of the garden well he didn't say that you cannot eat from every tree of the garden he said you can only eat of one tree of the garden so there's an exaggeration then at this the woman said to the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but god and she's now left off jehovah She's left Jehovah out now, so she's bought into the devil's, um, as it were, mindset, the devil's cunning. Now, she's not aware of it, but she's dropped off the word Jehovah. Now, this is critical for you Jehovah Witnesses who put the sanctity on this word. The word's gone, isn't it? For the Christians, it would be the Lord God, the Lord God. Now, the reason why the scholars outside of the New World Translation chose to use Lord if I can put it as simply as I can, it was out of respect for the Jews who didn't want to give a name to God. They chose to leave it sacred, and um, the scholars, to be fair to the Jewish people, just said, we'll use Lord. But the Jehovah Witnesses defied that and just said, we're going to use Jehovah. So they put a name on it. But God has said about the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, you must not eat from it, nor must you touch it. Now, that was an exaggeration because they were allowed to touch it. They just weren't allowed to eat it. They had to tend of all the trees in the garden. Otherwise, you'll die. At this, the serpent said to the woman, you will certainly not die. For God knows that in, that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. Well, they already knew that because they were already made in the image and the likeness of God. Okay? And they were given the idea of what was good and bad. So consequently, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was something desirable to the eyes. Yes, the tree was pleasing to look at. Um, see, the serpent's got her focus on the thing that she shouldn't have. So she began talking of its fruit, take, taking of its fruit and eating it. Now, this is an instance where we have one person solely alone in sin. Eve is the only person that was in sin alone. Absolutely alone. You see, when sin, when Eve ate, she was, for some point in history, the only one that was in sin. And afterward, she also gave some to her husband. Now, this is something that we miss. Why did Adam eat? We get this impression that they deliberately rebelled and, oh, they were bad and evil and all this sort of stuff. 
Adam was made in the image and likeness of God. Jesus is the second Adam. This has got everything to do with our identity. This, this will undermine shunning. If you want to get rid of shunning, you've got to know what your identity is. Shouldn't Adam have just shunned this woman and gone, for goodness sake, look what you've done. She had no way out of it. She had no way to come back from it. No matter how hard she tried, she was gone for goddess. There was no way back. All on her own, alone, gone. Fallen short, in sin, with no way of recovering whatsoever. Oh, we look at the story in the garden like it's, oh, those silly people in the garden. It's, no. When Adam ate, when Adam ate, it was probably the most radical moment in time that we've seen second to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, if not more so. Because Adam didn't shun Eve, did he? He had every right to. But why didn't he shun Eve? Why? Why did he give up everything he had and eat from that, whatever it was, an apple? Or whatever it was. Why? Well, when did God, where do we know the words of God from? The Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say? Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for a friend. Oh, the story of the garden, you've got, you just don't know about it. Oh, you've been told all this horrible rubbish about how stupid they were and how evil they were and the woman was deceived, but the man deliberately ate. Well, why did he deliberately ate? He deliberately ate, no different to Jesus deliberately going to the cross because he loved the woman. Our identity is in love. you got this JW convention at the moment. I forget what it's called. Love never fails or you never fall off love and all this. Yet they've got this horrible reputation for shunning people. The reason for that is they try and put their God before the people that they're supposed to love. God's not intimidated by you putting your family first. God's not intimidated by you putting your, your wife first. God doesn't get intimidated by anything. But we make up these rules that he won't love me anymore if I don't do this and I don't do that. I have to do something or not do something to make God happy or stop him from being sad or I'm going down the ladder. No. Adam's choice was consequential. It was consequential on all of us. Had an effect on all of us. Destroyed a lot of us. But it was a decision made out of love. Oh, gee, that's hard to comprehend, isn't it? Why did you think God himself decided to come and fix it all? Oh, Jesus wasn't God. That's nonsense he wasn't God. That's nonsense. God took responsibility for everything that has happened to us when he died on the stake. They are a said stake. What difference does it make if it was a stake or a in the shape of an A or a B or a C or a D. He took responsibility and accountability for the woman being deceived by the serpent. Oh, where's this guy coming from? What's he talking about? I'm talking about he didn't shun us either. He gave up his life for us and buried himself, allowed us to kill him and do you know what? He allowed us to kill him. He didn't shun us. He had every right to shun us. We failed. We, we crucified him and he still didn't shun us. Oh, you've got your religion wrong, Jehovah Witnesses. That's why there's so much upturn in, in your religion and other religions as well. Shunning is not a part of Christianity. 
It's not a part of Jehovah. It's got nothing. You know what it is? It's fear. It's a thing that's come out of a man-made um, religious idea so that you, your position with God isn't threatened. It's a selfish idealism made up by a twisted religious person at some stage in their thinking and they've penned it and it's just gone spiritually gone through the organization and of course if somebody's wavering or leaving we can't have them because it'll threaten my position with my god and that's rubbish god wasn't worried about his position with himself he allowed us to crucify him to show that greater love is no man than this and to lay down his life for a friend and years are shunning people over nonsense absolute nonsense you don't get a second chance at life your doctrine that you're going to get a second chance at life's rubbish. This life that we have now is it. It's precious. There's no marriage in heaven. Jesus said that on purpose. There's no marriage in heaven so that you'd appreciate the life that you have now. Oh, yeah, look, honestly, your religion's run away with you. Shunning is not of God. When you go to your convention this year, you look at it and you weigh up what you're thinking. Do I put God first or do I put the people I'm supposed to love first? Do you think God's intimidated by you loving the people that he died for? Do you think he needs your love more than what they do? You must be deluded if you think that he does. He loved us before we loved him. Shunned. How dare you shun somebody and say you're a Christian? How dare you some shun somebody and say it's part of the New Testament? How dare you? How dare you? Greater love is no man than this, than to lay down his life for a friend. Think about it. Who are you distance yourself from? Honestly, is it worth it for a religion that doesn't really mean anything to, to Jehovah? Jehovah's watching and he's going, who's really loving their neighbor as their self here? Jesus didn't say you've got to love the Lord your God with all your mind and with all your heart and all your soul as the final commandment. It's got nothing to do with it. Jesus said love your neighbour as yourself. That's a golden rule. A lot of shunning has got to do with the fact that you don't even like yourself. Religion can mess you up. It's not on purpose. It's not deliberate. Yeah, I know you, you, you're well intended and you, you want to do the right thing. But if you're shunning people that you are supposed to love, then you're really making a spectacle of yourself. Turn the tide. You'll hear the bloke next door singing out and screaming out and his dog's barking and he yells out abuse. And oh, The other night he'd come out at three o'clock in the morning and he sung out, you think you're you Hefner and you live in the Playboy Mansion. Ra ra ra. Me and the missus are lying there going, what's wrong with him? Anyway, he filled up he filled up his driveway with tiles and the pieces were too big and his tires were getting slashed. So it took him a week to dig it all, all out and he's had it in a trailer down on the street for the last week or so. And something in me in my spirit's just gone, forget about all the stuff he says to you and stuff. Chucking stuff over the fence at you and that. Go down there and, and tell him you'll get rid of the load of stuff you got in your trailer and you'll bring him back a nice load of 20 mil aggregate to throw in his driveway. Well, I went down there today and I did it. The missus said I was mad. I went down and I said, mate, I'll take your trailer away during the week and I'll bring you back a load of aggregate. 
Why? What did it cost me? What did it really? What difference did it make to help someone that hates you? Really, he could have told me to go and get stuff, but he stood there with a strange look in his face going, what? Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it tomorrow for him. And you have people that have relied on you and loved you. You've raised them. And they love you and they need you. And you've let a religion come between the people that you love and depend on you. What sort of an example is that, honestly? God's not happy with that. Jehovah's not happy with that. You're deluded if you think Jehovah's happy with that in your suit and your pretty dress. I challenge you now to get on the phone. Get on the phone. Even if it's a text, I love you. Some people desperately right now need to hear from you a word. Just a word, a thought. Reach out your hand. You've caused hurt and pain. I sat down there in the park the other day with an old Jehovah Witness woman and she said, I've been left, I've been abused all my life. And she was sitting on the waterfront, the poor old thing, there wasn't much left of her. Overweight, arteries probably blocked. She didn't look like to me like she had long ago. But she was sitting there and I saw this old woman and I thought, you know, she's had the guts kicked out of her all her life. And she's sitting on an old picnic chair, looking out across the water, at the mountains. And I thought, okay, the poor old thing is deceived and all the rest of it. But do you think Jehovah is going to leave her behind? Do you honestly think Jehovah is going to leave the people behind that you think are apostates and stuff? Soften your heart. I don't care what religion you are. Most of us have got it mixed up. We're all going to be saved by grace. We're fighting over beliefs and all this other stuff. <sighs> he loved us before we loved him. Get out and turn it around. Throw the shunning out. Your religion is not worth it. And love. You'll feel better yourself. You've got a limited amount of time. And after that, it's done. Turn it around, send a message, do something, reach out to somebody and, and make a difference. Shunning doesn't discipline people, it breaks people. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a horrible, tyrannical form of discipline that causes psychological, mental and emotional harm. If you're passing on that kind of form of behavior to the people around you as an example get out on your knees and pray cry and say lord i just can't do this anymore jehovah i can't do this anymore i love these people and i've pushed them away and you know what he'll do he'll go oh he's finally or she's finally got it i went and died on a stake for you mongrels for you pack of mongrels because i love you I loved you so much, I let you even kill me. I had to raise myself from the dead, and then I even went on to still say here, have eternal life through what I've done in my son. Oh, Jesus wasn't God. Wake up to yourselves. Send a text, reach out to somebody, and make a difference. Prove that you are a Christian. Prove that you are a, Je a Jehovah Witness. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist. It's nearly time for dinner. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.